reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me, listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I make him a witness to the peoples, a leader, and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. I say 4b because uh, verse 4, or verse, uh, verse 3 kind of cuts right off in the middle of a sentence, and so we're just going to start with the beginning of new sentences. And that's what it means when, when we say 4b or c, is there's a, a division within the verse uh, that's usually pretty clear. Uh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. The term white privilege, has anybody heard that before? Does anybody know where it comes from? It comes from this one essay uh, in 1989 written by a woman named Peggy McIntosh. And uh, she was somebody who worked in, in gender studies, primarily academic, and she said, I noticed something in, in, in gender studies that, that sort of uh, that frustrated me. It was whenever I talked to, to men about uh, gender bias and, and issues in, in the workplace and the environment and things like that, they are always happy to acknowledge or are willing to acknowledge uh, that it affects women negatively. But they never are willing to accept or willing to acknowledge that it can affect men positively. That is, when, when people suggest that somebody benefits from some sort of privilege, they uh, immediately get defensive and, and, and angry and frustrated. They, they want to reject that idea. And she said, it made her think, she's, uh, she's white, and, and she said, maybe think about race. When, um, when I think about race issues, do I have the same sort of 
blinders on that men did when they thought about women's issues. That is, I, I see racism as a problem, but do I notice, or, or how do I uh, notice when it affects me in a positive way? And so she, she decided, just as an exercise, to start jotting down the things that she could do or expect that uh, a, a black woman in her situation could not expect or would not have the opportunity to have. It wasn't, it wasn't like an exhaustive list or anything. It was just 26 things. It, it, it wasn't huge, but um, it, was, it was just an, an exercise. And she noticed, uh, just off the top of her head, if, if she were to, to be in a place and asked to speak to the person in charge, chances are it would be somebody of her race. If, uh, if she wants to, she could arrange to be around people of her own race pretty much all the time without it having any real negative effect on her career or social prospects. Wouldn't, wouldn't interfere with her life all that much. Uh, she could easily find uh, band-aids, toys, books, and dolls that represent people that look like her or her race. And, and she comes around and she says, this is sort of like an invisible knapsack. I don't, I don't know why she used knapsack and said that, but uh, an invisible knapsack is, is sort of just the, the, the things that we carry around with us that we don't realize we're carrying around with us. Um, and it's a sort of um, a collection of, of passports and, and code books and, and maps that make it easy for us to move smoothly through the world. Um, and, and the process of looking at this for her was eye-opening. She said until then she thought of racism as a sort of individual acts of cruelty and never saw it as a system that she was a part of or, or that, that conferred advantages on her and her group of people. Now we don't notice our invisible knapsacks because we've always had them with us and by design in a sense or, or by sort of uh, collective acknowledgement they are invisible. They're not something that we notice. They've always been there, we've always had them, and we don't necessarily see. But when we start paying attention to things, we notice that we all have some degree of privileges. I've noticed that being a young white male pastor carries with it a lot of privileges. When, um, when I don't do a very good job at work or when I'm distracted at work because of my kids, people tell me, oh, he's such a good dad. When my female colleagues do the same thing, they get told they need to be more professional in their life. Nobody, nobody ever tells me when, when my family comes or I bring friends that look like me that it made them uncomfortable to be in church today. When I tell people that I'm a pastor, everybody believes me. They, you know, they, they just look at me and they say, oh yeah, that fits. Nobody ever insists on calling me assistant pastor even though I'm clearly the only one here. Nobody ever introduces me to their friends as a, a man pastor in the, in the way that sometimes women get introduced as lady pastors. The most obvious time my, my privilege has been clear for me is I took Jane when she was a little bit she was about four months in an airport. Uh, we were flying to Oklahoma and, and people dropped everything to help me. It was, it was astounding. The, the, the gay agents would rearrange people's seats so that I could have an empty seat next to me for the baby that made it a little bit easier. An old lady offered to carry my suitcases. <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> and, and I was not the only single parent on the flight. And I wondered why other people didn't, it didn't avail themselves of the benefits of being a parent. Uh, but it was being a, a sort of flustered dad with a child is a very different thing from being a flustered mom with a child. When I'm at, at Presbytery, when I'm doing things in a larger church, people ask me to speak even when I don't know what I'm supposed to be talking about. People want me to be on committees and it makes me look valuable. It makes me look impressive. It makes me look like I know what I'm doing, even when I don't. And for uh, female pastors and for my colleagues who are, who are people of color, that does not happen in the same way. In fact, the opposite is true, right? The expectations for them are different. Nobody gives them a, a pass in the same way they don't have in their invisible knapsack, the things that I have in my invisible knapsack. And for this reason, it's worth looking into your own invisible knapsack. In, in, what, in terms of what advantages that you have that maybe you haven't thought about, and what spaces that you're comfortable in that other people aren't comfortable in, being a, a, a Christian, being a Protestant Christian especially, is, is, uh, has its own collection of, of privileges. Like nobody ever thinks that there's a, a, a divide between our duty to God and our duty in country. 
nobody ever accuses us for our religion of being disloyal to the United States. And that's something that has happened to Catholics in the past, happens to people of other religions now, especially Muslims. There, there's a, a distrust uh, because of their faith. And we don't experience that, right? Nobody ever assumes that, um, that we have a, a divided loyalty, even though we do, right? Our loyalty is to Christ of anything else. Um, it's not something we can get rid of, right? It's, it's how other people treat us. I can't go to the airport and say, no, 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 could you treat me as a, as a woman instead of a man today? I, it feels unfair. We, we can't take off our invisible knapsack. We can't get rid of it. It's just something that we have. So the question becomes, what do you do with it? Now, Paul, in this passage to the Philippians, wants us to know that he has the biggest, most impressive knapsack you can possibly imagine. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrew circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Pharisee who were the strictest upholders of the law, and he was so passionate about the law that he was a persecutor of the church. He was trained under the rabbi Gamaliel, who was this famous rabbi who was very impressive. His parents had all the money that they needed to send him to the finest schools. His birth was so impressive that Romans were sometimes afraid to, to do things to him. He had all of the privilege, and beyond all that, he was a Roman citizen. And being a Roman citizen was, was maybe the biggest privilege of all of these things, because Roman citizens have all of these special advantages that other people don't have. Uh, they could never be beaten. It was forbidden for a Roman citizen to be beaten. Roman citizens were guaranteed the right to a trial. They were guaranteed the right to uh, appeal the results of a trial all the way up to Rome. Now, other, other people didn't enjoy that privilege. The Roman state was built essentially to benefit citizens, and it was built at the expense of non-citizens, the, the, the colonized people, the territories that they conquered. And so Paul had this vast amount of privilege. He has an incredible amount of privilege for a Jew living in the first century. Anybody else uh, would not be able to do a lot of the things that he did. He did not have the rights that he did. He has a degree of invulnerability in the society that is rare, and it's hard to acquire. His credentials would and did impress everybody. And yet, he almost never uses his privilege. Consciously, that is. It, I, I told you Roman citizens were forbidden from being beaten. Paul gets beaten all the time. In Philippi, he's beaten in jail. He and his, uh, his brother in Christ, Silas, they're, they're beaten and thrown in jail because they cast out a demon from a slave woman who's making money for her owners. Um, and they're beaten and thrown in jail. And, and does he say, oh, by the way, I'm a citizen. You better watch out. No. He doesn't mention it until afterwards when they, when they try to, to release him in secret. He insists that the assault on the gospel be recognized, that they, that they apologize because they don't, he doesn't want the gospel to be impugned. In, um, in Lystra, they take him out and they stone him. Does he say anything in advance that, that he cannot be stoned? He can't be beaten? He can't be executed? No. He doesn't mention it. They take him outside the city and they leave him for dead. And he moves on. In his letters, he doesn't claim the authority that he would have by being who he is. When he writes to introduce himself to the Romans, he hasn't met the Romans. They don't know him. They, don't, they haven't heard of him. He says, I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ and an apostle of God. That's it. He doesn't say, you know, taught by Gamaliel, a Pharisee, righteous under the law, perfect, one of the, one of the great evangelists of the first century. He doesn't, he doesn't say any of that. What he says is a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul has this astounding amount of, of privilege that he could claim, amount of, of access and power in his life, but he almost never uses it. Why? Why not? In our passage today, Paul tells us why. Because all of these things, all of these hats that he can wear, all of these privileges that he has, all of this stuff in his invisible knapsack, he counts as nothing in comparison to the love of Christ. His identity is not in, in who he 
who was born. It's not in where he was trained, what school he went to, what job he does. His identity is firmly rooted in Christ, and Christ is the only identity that matters to him. He says, all of that other stuff is rubbish to me because this is who I am. I am a beloved child of God. I have been baptized. I have been clothed in Christ. And this clothing is the only clothing that I want to wear in this world. The love of Jesus is so much more valuable. The call and work of being a servant of Christ is so much more rewarding than anything else in the rest of his life, any of the other identities that he might hold. Now, Paul talks about this in regards to Jesus. Earlier in the book of Philippians, one chapter early, earlier in Philippians 2, he quotes this ancient hymn that says, that says uh, though Jesus was in the form of God, was equal to God, was God, he humbled himself on the cross. That is, if, if, we, if we add up all of the, the privileges that Paul had, and Paul had impressive privilege, they were nothing compared to the privileges that Jesus had. And yet, Jesus humbled himself even to the point of dying on a cross for us. Now, Paul couldn't do that. Paul was a Roman citizen. Roman citizens were forbidden to be crucified. All Paul could do was, as best as he could, choose his identity in Christ over other identities, choose to suffer alongside his partners in ministry, over freeing himself from suffering, using his own privilege. Now, he acknowledges, and I, and I think this is a crucial thing, that this is not something, privilege is not something that we can take off completely, right? He acknowledges that he is not perfect. He has not obtained the goal that he would like to, to attain, which is perfect unity with himself and Christ. But he presses on towards the goal. It is an active work that we must do to take on the identity of Christ and to release the other identities that we're so tempted to hold on to and cling to in our lives. Now, I've been hedging a little bit, right? I said Paul almost never uses his privilege. Now, there's two... Um, Two aspects of this. One is that you don't, you don't always have control over it, right? Um, Paul can consciously let go of as much privilege as he possibly can, but still, people are going to treat him differently, going to look at him differently, going to act differently around him. So he can't, he can't take it off completely. The other thing is there are two times when Paul does use his privilege. One, I already mentioned, right? And the other time comes at the end of the book of Acts. Paul gets arrested in Jerusalem on some trumped up charges and, and they take him over uh, to the governor the governor holds him for two years and then there's a new governor that comes in and the new governor says I'm going to hold a trial um, so he brings all of uh, the, his accusers up and uh, the new governor's name Festus is the Roman governor he looks at it and he says look this this sounds like disagreement or doctrine this sounds like something that is not my problem or my business but before the sentence can be carried out Paul appeals to the emperor. Before the sentence can be made, Paul appeals to the emperor, right? That's his right as a Roman citizen. He can appeal things to a higher court. Now, why he does so, when it's so clear to the Roman government that he has broken no laws, he's done no wrong, he is in no trouble, is a mystery, right? Until we start to listen to what Paul has been saying, he's been saying, I want to go to Rome. I want to get to Rome. Rome is somewhere where I feel called to be. Jesus has been telling me that I need to get myself to Rome. And where does the emperor live? Rome. When Paul finally uses his privilege, it's not to save his own skin. It's not to escape a beating or a stoning or protect himself. Paul uses his privilege to stay in prison. Paul uses his privilege so that he might suffer on behalf of Christ and he might go where Christ has called him, where Christ has sent him. Because doing so will allow him to be a servant of Christ. He knows that he might be signing his own death warrant. And the truth is, at the end of the book of Acts, we know that Paul gets to Rome, we know that Paul stays in prison, and we don't know anything else that happens. That's it. It's the last we hear. We don't. We don't have a choice about who we are with. Or how people treat us, whether it's, it's kindly or not because of who we are. 
But we do have a choice as to what identity we will place in front of and above all other identities. And for us, that identity is Christ. And Christ had all of the privileges in the world, and yet he let go of all of them so that he could come and be with us and suffer with us so that we would know that our suffering is touched by, is loved by, is blessed by God, so that we could be lifted up to his power and privilege in the promises of God, so that we might be united with him. And in these choices, which we make every day as we try to run the race that has been set before us, may we be like Paul, and may we be like Jesus, who chose suffering in love, clothing themselves in the love of God revealed in our baptisms, and made themselves love that we might be lifted up. As you go forth from this place, I invite you to go forth putting on Christ, shedding whatever other hats that you might have, and placing this identity above all and for all and through all so that we might Make ourselves one as Jesus did with all who suffered, and be like him in our life, in our death, and be joined with him in our resurrection. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.